Well, welcome to episode five of the Diabetes Vault. And today we're joined by two guests. The first guest is Jane Yardley, and it's Jane's paper that we're actually going to be looking at today. So we'll sort of do some introductions and then uh, Jane can explain the paper. And the other guest, who I'm sure you've probably seen before, is Daria. And Daria is better known as Daria. You've changed your Instagram handle recently. Yeah, like 15 times, probably in the last six months. Um, I used to be T1 level Daria for anyone who would know me or consider to know me. Yep. And now you are? I think I am Daria.arof. You are indeed. Yes, that's what I've got. Okay, good. Matt Campbell is also here as well as he is every week. So before we get into the paper, should we just do full introductions? So Jane, would you like to give us a bit of background about yourself and your history with diabetes? Uh, Sure. Full disclosure, I do not have diabetes. That's always one of the first things that people ask me, but I've done a lot of work with people who have type 1 diabetes. I have now been in this area for about 17 years, if we include all the PhD work, and it's always been around exercise. I'm now an associate professor at the University of Alberta in Canada. A lot of my work has involved resistance exercise, so weightlifting, uh, because not a lot of people tend to venture into that area. I've also looked a little bit with high intensity intermittent exercise, which is what we'll be talking about today. And at the moment, I'm moving a little more into women's health because there is very little research on the effects of the menstrual cycle and menopause on how uh, women with type 1 diabetes respond to exercise. So that's where I'm going to be going in the future. So, yeah, it sounds incredibly complicated because um, certainly if you add other elements such as the menopause into it, it's already complicated enough for us. But we'll get on to that. Um, Daria, would you like to introduce yourself? First of all, I was going to say, bless your soul, Jane, for get going into that area because it is really needed and there is zero research in it. As a female with type one, um, I know that. And I'm also master's nutrition. What am I, a graduate now? I don't even know. But anyway... <laughs> So yeah, I've, I know that there is no research in that and it's really needed, but God, I don't even know how to introduce myself these days. Well, <laughs> um, I am a type one diabetic. Um, I used to do a podcast together with Andrew called what type ones eat. That is probably how I ended up here today. I That's am also... how we all ended up here. <laughs> Actually. Yeah. So welcome guys. <laughs> <laughs> And Andrew, thank you for making me blow the dust off my mic because I haven't done this for a while. I am a nutrition master's graduate now. Um, I think we even got our diplomas, but I am not so sure because I'm not in the UK any longer. And I now work in food marketing, funnily enough. So that is what I do. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, obviously, welcome both of you. And thank you very much for for agreeing to come on here. Um, I think first port of call would be to to give the listeners a little bit of background about what Matt and I have been doing, which is for the first three episodes of this, we were talking about specifically insulin resistance. And and our next set of top of episodes, sort of open-ended at the moment, we haven't agreed how many, is going to be about exercise. Matt, would you like to just briefly go over what we went through last week? Because it leads really nicely into to, um, Jane's paper. Yeah, sure. So um, kind of in keeping with the running theme, we discussed a paper from my group and it really looked at some of the challenges that people with type 1 diabetes can face when exercising. And as as I'm sure you'll probably come to learn through this particular podcast, it really kind of encompasses what has been done fairly well within the literature up to now. So looking at aerobic-based exercise and insulin dose adjustments around that. But of course, what we also discussed was some of the limitations with that in that it's, it's, it's very prescriptive. It really doesn't allow for kind of spontaneous exercise. And obviously, once you start to venture outside of aerobic endurance-based exercise, then you know, that's where some of the, or at least historically, where some of the recommendations have really started to fall apart. So last week, we, we looked at a couple of, well, we looked at one very specific research paper, which looked at insulin dose adjustments and how heavily adjusting insulin dose was really, really important, Uh, not just before exercise, but also afterwards. And that was to try and combat those uh, those really dangerous glucose lows that you get. And we also discussed that one of the main reasons for that is a um, heightened level of insulin sensitivity really late on into the exercise period. 
And I think that leads really nicely on to what we're going to discuss today, which is a a completely different type of exercise modality and and really try and pick apart why glucose responses might be different between different exercise modalities. So I guess that leads quite nicely on to Jane introducing uh, this uh, paper today. Um, Okay, well, thanks. And uh, yeah, it's a bit about modality as well as timing, uh, because here we're comparing a fasted exercise protocol versus uh, the same exercise being performed in the afternoon, a few hours after a meal. And, And we're talking about high intensity intermittent exercise. And I at one point had looked at all the studies that were out there and wondered why they were so inconsistent. A lot of them were comparing high intensity interval exercise against aerobic exercise. And usually when we're comparing those two modalities, we see fairly consistently that as soon as you started adding in some high intensity, that glucose doesn't drop as quickly. And part of the reason for that is that the glucose that you're relying on for that type of activity is coming from a different place. Um, During aerobic exercise, the glucose that's being used is typically the glucose that's in circulation in the blood. As soon as you add in adrenaline, which was, uh, or epinephrine, whichever word you want to use, it's the same thing. You're starting to access glucose that is stored in the liver and glucose that is stored in the muscle. 80% of the body's stored glucose is actually found in the muscle. And once it gets put into the muscle, it can't come back out. It's only fate is to become fuel for muscle contraction. Whereas the liver, which actually stores close to 20%, has an enzyme that will let you release that glucose back into circulation. And when adrenaline or epinephrine comes into circulation, it actually allows the liver to release some of that glucose into circulation, which can actually cause an increase in blood glucose in some very high intensity exercise situations. But it's a very inconsistent response. And we're still trying to tease apart a lot of the things that will affect that glucose response. So I I talked to a lot of athletes and, you know, in Canada, of course, hockey players, And hockey players with type one diabetes say, oh, I'm always high at the end of my games, but I'm always low at the end of my practices. Uh, And so it tells me there's both a physiological component as well as a psychological component when we're talking about a lot of these things. But if we go back to the high intensity interval exercise, I was looking at a handful of studies and I think there were about nine or 10 of them at the time. And some of them showed a decrease in glucose with high intensity intervals. Some of them showed no change in glucose and some of them showed an increase in glucose. And the only thing that was different between the ones that showed a decrease and the ones that showed an increase was that the ones where glucose was increasing were being performed in a fasting state. And so I thought, okay, well, let's compare that. Let's take the same group of people so we can get rid of the possibility that it has anything to do with sex or fitness or age. And let's take that same group of people and have them do one uh, set of exercise in the morning. It's the same protocol. And then exercise in the afternoon, same protocol. The other criticism for some of the studies that had already been published was that the exercise wasn't intense enough. And maybe that's the reason why glucose went down instead of up. And so we chose a very intense protocol. Uh, Our participants were doing 10 second sprints every two minutes times 12. After about five or six of them, a lot of them were telling me, the participants were telling me how much they hated me because it was like, you just can't catch your breath after 10 or 11. Some of them are feeling nauseous. So lack of intensity was not a problem with this protocol. But what we saw uh, when we did the analysis was that glucose was tending to move in two different directions, that when they were doing this type of exercise while fasted, there was a tendency for glucose to rise. Whereas when they were doing it in the afternoon, there was a tendency for glucose to go down. Uh, And so that's kind of led to this idea that, I mean, the recommendation I tend to give is that if you're really struggling with lows during exercise, you might want to consider doing that exercise in a fasted state, because what we were seeing in terms of the trends here for the high intensity interval stuff, it's actually similar to what's been seen with aerobic exercise and with resistance exercise. So it seems to be a fairly consistent thing that, you know, the the general trend is, is for glucose to go up if you're doing that exercise while fasting. And I thought that was a a fairly practical outcome. (laughs) Can I ask you a question? Um, How do you measure that people actually get to that high intensity state? Do you actually measure their pulse or like, what is the criteria? 
It's a really good question, just to interject very quickly, because it was one of the things as I was reading through, I was thinking, surely we all have different levels of intensity. But you, but what you did and you covered it in the paper was you got that baseline for everyone. So you can go into a bit more detail, but you are, the answer was that everyone's different, Daria, because to a certain extent, I would have different intensity levels to, to, to you and, and, and to other people. So you're, you're right to ask how they measured it, but it's also important to, to establish that they had a baseline to work from. Yeah. And that's one of the really good questions is uh, the difference between absolute and relative intensity. And we work a lot with, with relative intensity. And to do that, we will make our participants do a test where we can uh, figure out the maximum amount of oxygen that they can use while exercising. And usually what that involves is putting them on a bike or a treadmill and then making it harder and harder and harder and harder and really pushing them to go until they really can't go anymore because they just cannot breathe or their legs are shaking so much that they can't, you know, keep up with the treadmill or the bike. Uh, and once we have that maximum value, then we can go back and calculate if it's on a treadmill, it'll be a speed and an incline. If it's on a bike, it'll be a resistance where, you know, a set amount um, of that maximum is. And so for this particular study, the recovery was at 50% of that maximum amount. And that would be Normally, a pace at which you can have a conversation with the person next to you, needing an occasional breath here and there to sort of, you know, catch up. But as soon as you start adding sprints in that type 50%, it doesn't actually let you fully catch your breath after two minutes before you have to go into that next sprint. Uh, and where the sprints are concerned, we were yelling at them and pushing them. And that's maximal. That's like as hard as you can possibly go for 10 seconds. And even top athletes after three or four sprints are really going to start feeling that burning in the legs and huffing and puffing and having a really hard time catching their breath. And that's basically what we were looking for. If they were able to have a conversation with me after six sprints, I knew they weren't working hard enough. Okay. I see. But there wasn't like, there was something attached to them that was measuring the 50% and it was heart rate. Yeah. And, and resistance on the bike. Okay. Just to, just to ask a, a kind of, basic physiological question there then because i mean obviously with with these really tightly controlled protocols you know and you can hook you know your participants up to all this equipment you can measure the heart rate you can even stick a mask on them and measure how much oxygen you know they're kind of consuming so you, you know you get a really good indication of, of what intensity somebody's working at but you know obviously for the the average joe on the street they're not going to have that and, and and also in terms of different types of exercise, you know, so if you're playing a game of hockey, if you're playing a game of football or a game of rugby, actually, you know, that's going to take you 80, 90 minutes to do. And and what you'll actually find is that, you know, you can kind of, you know, you, you'll get kind of VO2 drift, you know. So actually that, that kind of absolute, that absolute intensity that you're starting at and you're kind of prescribing exercise at, that's probably going to be a lot harder towards the back end of the game than what it is during the earlier stages. So can you give any kind of like practical recommendations to people that, you know, out there who might think, well, what can I do to try and to try and map or track intensity and how that might change over something like an intermittent based, you know, exercise like rugby or football or, or hockey? Uh, well, I mean, heart rate is one way that you can measure it. There's also that heart rate drift, though, as you're talking about the, uh, the demands, um, you never fully recover. Part of it, you can go by breathing, but again, towards the end, it gets harder and harder to breathe. So, I mean, if you're, if you're doing this type of training on any type of equipment where you can actually measure speed and resistance and anything like that, then you can certainly set it at, at very specific things. I know for myself, I've always been a big fan of just sort of listening to my body and knowing, um, you know, when that breathing inflection happens, there's a point at which you start breathing faster. And that's usually an indication of what's going on metabolically, where you're, you're switching fuels almost. Although by the end of a really hard workout, you're going to find that you're there pretty much right away. <laughs> uh, it's I usually a like, really, go on. I feel like for me, I've just started like doing boxing training. Um, and for me, it's when like muscle failure happens. So like when I feel that I just like, I can't push anymore and that's about where my limit is, that is my like high intensity training. Whereas otherwise I can pretty much do quite a lot. Yeah. And um, you know, some people are really just not that good at pushing themselves that hard and might need a, a coach or a personal trainer behind them to, or, you know, even a, a, a training buddy to, to be like, okay, you're, you're slacking off here because you're able to have a conversation with me right now. And you should be at an intensity where you're breathing so hard that you can't talk. 
but yeah, if, if you're able to push yourself that hard, then, then awesome. And, uh, and there's a lot of benefit as I'm sure Matt will talk about a little bit more to being able to hit those higher intensities because overall it just improves your aerobic fitness and it improves your ability to use fat as a fuel source. Um, and it improves the way that your blood vessels can, can stretch and expand to accommodate blood, which makes them more like flexible in terms of the, the vessels themselves. And with a lot of cardiovascular disease and even small vessels diseases being associated with stiffness in the blood vessels, this type of training that really forces them to sort of stretch and come back is really good for like the whole vasculature of the body. No, I mean, as long as I don't lose all my teeth and don't break my nose, I think I'm going to be fine. (laughs) (laughs) Jane, it's interesting you mentioned earlier about weight training or, or, or actually resistance training because equally with Daria's question about intensity you know resistance I find a lot more intense than than actually heavy training um, that I found in previous years mainly because of the the amount of time that you take over trying to to stay at that resistant le- that sort of weight training resistance level but how would you measure intensity in in that respect would it be too to failure It depends on which population I'm working with, because if you have athletes, for example, who are good at pushing themselves, then we'll often try to do something like a one repetition maximum test. And what that means is that we put a lot of weight on, you know, let's just say we're doing bench press. We'll put a whole lot of weight on the bar. We've got somebody there to spot them to make sure that they're not going to drop the bar on themselves. And if they're able to push it up easily, we give them some time to recover. And then we put more weight on until we find that spot where they can finally just get it up. And based on that value of their one repetition maximum, we can estimate how much weight they can lift, say eight times or 15 times, depending on whichever protocol we decide to use for research. Now, I'm working with postmenopausal women right now. A lot of them have not done a lot of weightlifting, don't have a lot of experience with that type of movement, and also have joint problems that you want to be very careful about. And so, you know, we have to give them a long warm up. And with them, we tend to just do what we call an eight repetition maximum, which to be perfectly honest, is a bit more of an art than it is a science because you watch them lift the weight. And when they get to number eight, you see how much they're struggling. And if they're not struggling, then they're not at their eight rep max and you, you know, move on to something else, give them time to recover and then come back. (laughs) And, you know, when I was working with a lot of younger, more athletic people, it was really easy to find the eight rep max within one or two tries. And with, with the postmenopausal group, I'm finding we have to go back four or five times because a lot of them don't actually appreciate how strong they are. And so it it takes a little bit more sort of trial and error, but yes, we do always do a a baseline test and then whatever protocol we've got set out for the study, they'll come back once they've recovered from that test and it's all calculated based on whatever maximum or eight repetition maximum value we've determined earlier on. And a question for both yourself and Matt then about, because I know you both have, have looked in depth at exercise is, and Daria and I both advocate for you know sort of movement exercise and and we do it very often but do you find that lots of people that are diabetic type one and and also I guess I'm asking about type twos as well do you find that lots of people are very aware that they have to get movement into their lives and they have to exercise because not just because of the sort of physiological side but also the mental benefits that they get from it well, I mean, if, if we look at the literature, we know that people with diabetes tend to exercise less than people without uh, diabetes. Uh, we do have a few studies showing that. Uh, and we also know that as people age, they tend to be less active. And, you know, when I do have conversations with people who have diabetes about why they should be active and, and why they are active, the, uh, the answer it often isn't, you know, oh, because of my diabetes. It's, it's surprising how many of them are, it's just like everyone else. It's like, well, I really like being active. I've always been active. So I'm going to keep being active. I feel better when I'm active, but I don't know too many people who are like, well, you know, I have diabetes and therefore I have to be active so that I can you know manage my diabetes because with type one, we also know that people who aren't active, who become more active often sacrifice a little bit of blood glucose management, especially in the initial stages until they find that happy medium. And and we know that hypoglycemia is a major barrier to that exercise and physical activity. But one thing I've really been trying to advocate lately is that resistance exercise, because we're starting to see some studies. There were a few really nice ones that came out of uh, McMaster University lately uh, in Canada showing that uh, type 1 diabetes will actually make you lose muscle mass faster as you age. 
than people without diabetes and the strength and quality of the muscle also declines faster. And so when we're starting to look at having people with diabetes living really healthfully until their 60s, 70s and 80s, which we didn't always have before, now that our, our diabetes management and our diabetes care is so good, what we're starting to see, and which I think is going to become more problematic if people aren't more active, is a lot of frailty in those 60, 70, and 80-year-old individuals with type 1 diabetes who haven't been active enough to maintain muscle mass, joint mobility, and essentially what we call like, you know, functional mobility and strength. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly nothing in there that I would disagree with. Um, I would also add, it's also really good for bone health as well, you know? So if you're doing loading activity, if, you, if, you know, if, you, if you're kind of carrying around really heavy weights and doing, doing functional movements, it's really good for keeping bone health. And bone health is really important, not just for that functional side, but actually it's a, it's a really important organ system in terms of in terms of um, vascular health as well so again trying to prevent some of those horrible diabetes related complications that nobody likes talking about um, you know doing resistance based exercise doing hit training you know, which is really high intensity and, and you know lots of um, kind of weirded movements is really really important for that the, I guess the only thing which I'll kind of come, come back on that with is I mean I guess me and Jay I mean probably not so much Jane but certainly certainly me I, I often kind of kind of find myself falling down the rabbit hole a little bit and, and to, you know, talking to very similar like-minded people within the type one diabetes community, you know, two of which are probably, you know, you, Andrew and you, Dari, you know, where you guys are pretty switched on with your diabetes management, your nutrition, your exercise. Um, obviously, Dari, you know, you've got, you've got qualifications in that area now. And, and actually one of the big populations, which is, and it's probably the majority of people with type one is, is not those who, who do exercise regularly, who do really struggle with the blood sugar management, who do struggle with the nutrition. And, and I think one of the limitations of the work is that often when we when we go out to recruit participants for research studies, then one, we either sample from a very specific pool or it's a certain type of person that comes forward who wants to participate in that research. And, you know, nine times out of 10, those people that want to participate in the research are those who are really actively interested in the area you know that I mean that would kind of make sense I guess what we don't really hear a lot from is those people who who do really struggle with exercise and you know do you know don't do it very often so I'm not too, I'm not really sure whether we do exactly know what the what the proper motivators and barriers are of people with type one you know in, in terms of you know whether they're actually exercising or or not I think we we probably get a bit of a skewed picture well, we we certainly do in the UK anyway. I know a lot more work has come out in the US and Canada looking at that. I know no one asked me, but I'll still put my opinion in. Uh, <laughs> I just think it's just with like with anyone else. So like we all know we need to exercise, but the question is, do we or do we not? And it's just about like developing the habit of doing so and then finding an exercise type that you like and just starting to do it. And then it's kind of just like really getting yourself into it and it's no different for a type one or for a non-type one and I just think like diabetes doesn't have to be the ex the reason why you exercise and like it's good to exercise for absolutely everyone so yeah I just think it's like it's not a case of like I have type one diabetes I have to exercise it's more a case of just we have to exercise as a population so yeah I think that's a really good point and you know, just to kind of come back on one point, I, I often get asked, you know, what is what is the best type of exercise to do then if I've got if I've got type one diabetes? You know, you can kind of go through all the different types of different exercises and sports. And the answer to the question really is the one that you're enjoying doing and the one that you're going to do on a on a regular basis, you know, and then you've got to try and fit the exercise management strategies around that, you know, rather than just saying, well, actually there's a there's a little bit of literature that's looked at resistance or aerobic based exercise. So you know, that's the only thing which I can do. It's not really that. It's about picking the exercise which you really enjoy, which which you think you can do consistently, and then you know, try and develop some strategies to, to manage your diabetes around that. I've always had this gut feel that people with with certainly type one that are trying to manage their their blood sugars, the results of exercising may actually be the driver behind not exercising, if you see what I mean, because your blood sugars are so difficult to control or can be so difficult to control. We interviewed uh, Nick the other day, also known as the diabetic athletic, and he was talking about repeating, repeatedly doing the same thing to learn un and understand how your body reacts to certain things. Quite often I exercise and 
if your blood sugars aren't behaving, I don't stop exercising because of it. I've kind of flipped over to the other way, which is I just I just enjoy the exercise. And I think that's probably the best thing to, to the best position to be in. I don't know. That's just for me, though. Very personal. Sorry, I, know. I, I very much agree with you, actually. And I just think the same because like you, it doesn't really matter like what your blood sugars will be. And I think there is a lot of issues with fear of hypoglycemia in general in the diabetes population. And obviously exercise kind of accelerates the, well, not accelerates, but like amplifies uh, hypoglycemia in general. So that's why people just don't do it. They like avoid the unknown really. But this is why these papers are so important. This is why talking about this stuff is so important and actually coming up with some ways of improving what could be something that you wouldn't do because you're worried about it. If Daria and I being on here can do anything, it could just be look. actually, yeah, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. You're going to think you've got it licked and you haven't got it licked because it will something else will happen. But ultimately, you, it's better to have some movement and to be exercising than not. And hopefully with the skills and the information that, that Jane and Matt are going to be providing, then you, it'll give you some, some idea of where to start. I'm just going to sort of add a few layers to this think uh, you know line of thought and discussion the first of that is going to be sort of a, a sex and a gender idea so sex being the biological variable and gender being the sociological one and the more work i start doing in this area the more i realize that you know the data we have showing that women are less active than men when it comes to type 1 diabetes could be just part of that general, okay, well, there are gender related things where the gender roles are often falling to the women to do more of the household work and, and more of the child care. And as much as that's shifting, there still is that tendency where women tend to feel that they have less time for themselves to be active and do things like that. But then um, there's also the idea of, of, you know, sex and do women respond or females respond the same way to uh, exercise when blood glucose changes are concerned because all of the data that we have right now is biased it is biased towards male participants almost all of the studies have been either entirely male or around 80 to 90 percent male and what little data we have right now that has focused specifically on female participants shows that there might actually be a difference in how the fuels are being used during exercise and the risk of hypoglycemia after exercise. And so all of these recommendations we have for carbohydrate intake and insulin adjustment, those are based on, you know, male dominant studies, and they might not be right for female athletes or female individuals just trying to be active on a day-to-day -day basis. And on top of that, some of the work that we're doing now, like qualitative studies, where we're just asking the questions, why do you exercise? What do you want to get out of exercise? How do you adjust, you know, your insulin and carbohydrate for exercise? We're finding more and more that we're getting different answers from men and women. And that women are a bit more concerned about staying thin, about being healthy. Men, it's a bit more about the competition and the social aspect. And that the women really don't want to carb up for exercise because that defeats the purpose of why they're exercising in the first place. And so, you know, the fact that we might not have the most precise insulin adjustments based on female body types might be very detrimental for, for those female individuals with type 1 diabetes trying to become more active because they, they might not be quite right. But then that whole idea that you're talking about with routine and, and trying the same thing over and over and over again, when I get asked by diabetes educators here in Canada, well, what do I tell my, my participant? I'm like, be a scientist, be a scientist with your body, perform the same experiment over and over and over and over again, change one variable at a time until you find that right combination that hits the sweet spot for you because everyone's quite different and, and routine is going to be your friend. If you can get on the same treadmill at the same time, at the same speed, with the same adjustment, you know, having eaten the same foods beforehand, you, you can tweak one or two of those variables until you find something that's, that's going to be a good fit. I was going to say, Jane, and then you find it and yay, your time of the month strikes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for coming in on that because I was actually just I was just about to raise that that uh, exact point because I was going to say you know obviously you can you can try and be as as controlled as you can possibly be in lots of different aspects and but obviously trying to balance the menstrual cycle as well. I mean, what what have you observed, Jane? You know, kind of as empirically as you possibly can to say, well, you know, if you're trying if you're trying to control all, all of these variables, but you've actually got this moving baseline you know, mm -hmm. a four or five week, three to four or five week period. So I, I, like what, what impact does that have? You know, what, 
Uh, we're only starting to scratch the surface on that. We've just submitted some data from a pilot study to diabetes care in their, it's not the short communications, but like the, it's basically a short report type of thing to be like, hey, we're finding this interesting trend. And so we have done one pilot study where we had women who were not on any type of hormonal birth control, because of course that adds in another layer there. But with the, the hormonal birth control, things are probably a bit more regulated, but we still don't know that for sure. That's our next study that we're doing. <laughs> Without birth control, what we were finding, and we were only comparing the late luteal phase to the follicular phase, because a lot of what we'd heard uh, from our, our female participants was that they were getting the most fluctuations right around that sort of perimenstrual time. So like right before their periods were starting, they were finding that they were a little bit wonky, maybe a little higher. And then it would sort of go back to normal during the, the follicular phase, which is like when the period's actually happening. But what we were finding was actually that um, during that, that luteal phase, the, the last week before the period, we had to give most of our participants carbohydrate supplements so that they didn't go low during exercise. I think it was six out of nine during that phase. Whereas I think we were maybe one out of nine during the follicular phase. And when we checked insulin levels in the blood, we didn't see a significant difference between the two, but that could also be just because we didn't have enough participants. We only had nine participants. Mm -hmm. And what we also saw was during that follicular phase, there was more hyperglycemia after exercise. And again, not sure if that's just, oh, we have small patient pool and therefore, you know, we're not seeing what's something real as we'd put it. But the fact that we're sort of seeing differences with a small group says that, okay, there's probably something that we need to look at a little more closely there. And that's just looking at, you know, two of those usually four weeks, but could be five for some people, right? Or even three for other people. And so now we are actually trying to do a bit more observational work in women who are using insulin pumps and CGMs to look at how much uh, insulin they need to manage their glucose during different parts of that menstrual cycle. Uh, and I'm hoping we can tease out some more information there because, you know, as Daria said earlier, there's, there's little to no information out there. But to be honest, I was also going to say like, even when I was little way before, like menstrual cycle came in, um, I've always like my insulin doses and basal changed every two weeks at least, and it keeps doing so. And it's a ver in a very like chaotic way. So it's not really related to anything, not even to stress. Like I can't even like, I can't track it back. So I've just kind of like got used to the fact that it's this way. And now I just change it whenever it needs changing. Um, and like my entire strategy changed pretty much every two weeks. So, wow. you know, I, I have heard from women who are trying to conceive, you know, the ones who, who track their cycles very, very closely. Most of them will actually have, if they're using a, 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 an insulin pump, they'll have different basal rates throughout the month to try and manage their glucose because mm -hmm. insulin sensitivity changes that much throughout, you know, a 20 four to 32 or whatever day cycle it might be. Cause we know of course that there's also a lot of variability in how long an actual cycle is among women. So, yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned in insulin sensitivity because that's the only time that I've spoken to people about this topic, obviously. And because I'm very interested in the insulin sensitivity side and, and the women I've spoken to and that they have been diabetic for many years or, very, or, or only just diagnosed and they, and they almost instantly know that sort of menstrual cycle will cause them um, problems with their insulin sensitivity and therefore their rates will have to change. They're just not sure what to level to change it to. And I guess that's the future. Mm -hmm. It's not the future. It's different every time. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's the current. It's, it's the now. It's the present. It. It's here. <laughs> but yeah, it's just like I feel generally with diabetes, like I used to be so like meticulous with it and so like precise, but you just you can't be. You need to kind of go with the flow and try adjust stuff on like on the go, because otherwise you'll just go crazy trying to perfect your blood glucose numbers. So, yeah. Um, I was actually going to ask Jane a question about the paper, which was, if I understood correctly, the protocol is to reduce your background insulin the night before. Is that so? Uh, if you're using multiple daily injections. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, why but that tends to only work for people who aren't active every single day. 
And this is why we often oh. encourage people who are very active to, to use insulin pumps, just because it's easier to make those fine tuned adjustments within an hour and a half of exercise, because it's only when you're doing the basal adjustments for, you know, long acting insulin that you're injecting once, maybe twice a day, if you decide to split that dose to help adjust more for exercise. So yeah, it is, it's certainly a bit more complicated when you're trying to do multiple daily injections for insulin management uh, around exercise. It's just like my thought behind it was that you kind of then get your blood glucose to kind of shoot up overnight and then you make them exercise and it obviously goes up again because they're already at a high level. What I found if like from my own experience, if I start exercising like at higher levels, they will shoot up inevitably. Whereas if I'm like at five fours, they will probably stay level which I don't know if it's the case for other people, but I've definitely found this for myself. Are you talking specifically about fasting exercise or also after? Uh, no, any kind of exercise. I actually don't do fasting exercise. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, we do have one fairly large observational study of adolescents that was published. I think Mike Riddell was one of the authors on that, and he's fairly well known for his exercise studies. Uh, and they pulled a whole bunch of data. And basically, like the title of the article is the higher they are, the further they fall. <laughs> Oh, and really? Yeah, he, he found that, and, and it actually makes sense in the context, like there are a few physiological studies that have actually measured fuel selection that show that when you're exercising in hyperglycemia, you're actually preferring to use glucose as a fuel more so than if you were in a normal glycemic range. So it, I think sometimes it just depends why you are at that level. If you're at that level because you have emitted too much insulin, then it's not surprising that you keep going up. But if you're at that level because you've had a snack or, um, you know, you've planned for exercise or it's right before a competition and you're all amped up and you got that adrenaline that's letting your liver release some glucose, then it's not surprising to have a really big drop. Yeah. And there's a, yeah. also a couple of really interesting, important points with that. So exactly as James just said, if, you, if you've got a really high glucose level, your body will preferentially want to use carbohydrate. And actually, if you're in a postprandial state, so if you just had a meal or if certainly within kind of three, four hours of having a meal and the vast majority of people, I mean, that's them for the, for, you know, for most of their day, really, not only will you preferentially use carbohydrate, but you'll also use, use the carbohydrate that you just ingested as well. So you actually end up burning off more carbohydrate, you, you know, so you'll, if, 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 you, if you were to actually measure the amount of carbohydrate that is being used, not only are you using the carbohydrate that you've got on board, naturally, but also you, you're going to burn uh, or you'll preferentially use the carbohydrate that you've also just ingested. One of the things which I was going to ask you was, I mean, you talk, I mean, again, just kind of coming back to this paper and, you know, reducing the basal dose the night before, if you're on, if you're on pens. I mean, we did a, a study where we did aerobic exercise and it was later in the afternoon and we had, you know, we had, we had people reducing their, their basal insulin dose early in the morning. And actually we didn't really see any difference during the rest of the day in terms of their overall glucose control. And that was a huge surprise to us. You know, we thought that they would just kind of go really, you know, sky, sky high, or at least you would see a greater degree of variability or they would just tend to ride higher for a longer period of time. Have you have you observed that if you know if if you're asking someone to, to alter the basal dose during the night and then they're going to perform exercise in the morning in a fasted state and and if you do see differences why do you think that is do you think you know is is it do we do we have different levels of different hormones kicking around at night that can influence blood sugar levels or what do you think? Okay, you got a couple of different questions in there that I'm going to see if I can address all at once. So the, the basal dose reduction for people who are using multiple daily injections, I have generally found with my participants, because I'm, I'm obviously not a medical practitioner. I can't say this is what you have to do. What I say is this is what's recommended. You do what you feel you need to do. I would appreciate it if you did the same thing for both exercise sessions or all three exercise sessions, if we have, you know, multiple sessions. And what I've found in general is that a the vast majority of, of my injection patients don't want to reduce their basal dose. They just, they're like, no, I never do it. Um, and so what they'll tend to do is if they're doing afternoon exercise, they'll reduce their bolus with their meal before exercise, or they'll have a snack before exercise where the morning exercise is concerned. We do see that, you know, insulin may be playing a role because for the most part, we're going to have a little bit less of it in circulation. If you haven't eaten in the last eight to 10 hours, uh, because that bolus insulin obviously is not going to be around. 
But we do also know that things like cortisol and growth hormone tend to be a little bit higher in the morning. And both of those hormones tend to promote more lipolysis. So fat burning, uh, using fat as your primary fuel source. And I would have really have liked to have had, um, you know, indirect calorimetry, being able to measure oxygen use during these exercise sessions to see if there was more fat being used than carbohydrate, but we just didn't have the budget for that in this study. But yeah, with that higher growth hormone, higher cortisol, we tend to see fat as a, as a fuel source a bit more. What that does is, you know, when you break down fat, you get these glycerol molecules, which are basically just three carbon molecules. Glucose is a six carbon. You can essentially take those three list, the, the three carbon glycerols, smush them together to make a glucose in the liver through a, pro, a process called gluconeogenesis. And so you can actually make more glucose out of the fat that you've used as a fuel source. There's also this possibility that if you're using more fat, uh, you're releasing more fat from fat stores in your body. And while they're in circulation, you end up with a form called free fatty acids. If you look at the literature related to type two diabetes, high circulating free fatty acids actually causes insulin resistance. And so what that can also do is then, you know, release, decrease the amount of glucose being used both during and after exercise, while you still have this higher level of, of free fatty acids in circulation. So we know with that fasted exercise, one, there's usually a higher reliance on fat. There's also usually a bigger increase in growth hormone with high intensity exercise, which then would probably give us an even bigger reliance on fat. So fat as a fuel source, may be playing a, a role in what we're seeing in terms of the blood glucose outcomes for these studies. And when you say, you know, that there's a, there's a really heavy or heavier reliance on fat, I mean, a lot of people listening to this will think, oh, great, you know, because I'm going to be burning more fat. So, I mean, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You know, what, what, what does that mean for, you know, the average person with type one? unless you're doing very, very long exercise sessions and not eating afterwards, it doesn't really mean a lot, <laughs> you know, in terms of body type, it, it might mean a little bit in terms of having higher glucose after exercise for several hours, potentially. And so if you struggle with hyperglycemia after high intensity exercise, you might not want to do it in a fasted state because we're showing that it consistently causes, you know, glucose to go up and, and even sometimes continue going up. And we're actually sort of testing a protocol right now to see if adding in just a little bit of aerobic exercise at the end of that fasted exercise session, if that will stop that, that big, what we call bubble, because there's a big, uh, you know, dome of glucose on the graph that we see when we're, when we've done it, uh, not glucose. Yeah. Glucose. Yeah. And I guess in terms of just the, the actual practicality of that, I mean, that could be something like a little gentle warm down, you know, like, yeah. I don't know, a, in a theory or a, a, bri a, a brisk walk or something like that. I mean, some brisk some walk. Really light intensity light cycle. If you tend to walk to and from the gym, you might incorporate it already without even knowing about it. it it's something that's mentioned in the American Diabetes Association exercise guidelines, but it really only has anecdotal support. There aren't any studies right now actually, you know, saying that yes, adding in this aerobic cool down period at the end of high intensity will stop uh, any hyperglycemia from happening. Jane, two questions. First one was how many people were on this research cohort? The, this one particular study, we had 12. When you do a repeated measures design where you've got the same people doing the same thing, if you've controlled fairly well for all of the other things around it, you can get away with a slightly smaller sample size. Obviously, 12 is still quite small and we'd be better off with like 20 to 30 if we really want to be absolutely certain about our results. But with the support that we have from other studies, I'm fairly confident in saying that, you know, fasting exercise does have a very different metabolic effect than, uh, than fed exercise in people with type one diabetes. And on the fasted side, how many of those 12 had that increase in blood glucose that you were talking about? And what was the extent of the increase? Absolute numbers. I can't remember the data off the top of my head. I know if we look at the study itself, I think we saw maybe a one to two millimole per liter increase. I've actually got it open here so I can, I can pull it out. I won't say that every single one of them went up because not every single one of them went up, but we definitely didn't have to give anyone carbohydrate to stop hypoglycemia with the morning exercise session. Whereas in spite of the really high intensity of this protocol, we still had to provide two participants with carbohydrates to not go low in the afternoon. So it's not all about the intensity. I think the fasting is a, is a more important aspect here in terms of hypoglycemia prevention. Jane, so I actually have a question. Wouldn't it be more comparable if you would do, for example, a fasted morning and then a non-fasted morning? So why, what was the reason for splitting it into two different parts of the day? 
That's an excellent question. The reason essentially was to compare to existing literature, right? Because right mm -hmm. now, almost all of the studies, they're either fasted in the morning or they are fed in the afternoon. If we were to do sort of like a follow-up study to this, then chances are we would do sort of um, like a forearm type of approach where we would mm -hmm. have fasted in the morning, fed in the morning, you know, fed in the afternoon. Fasted in the afternoon is a little difficult because nobody really wants to go that long without eating. Well, I think like six hours is okay, isn't it? I think ideally we want eight because if you want it to be yeah. like, yeah. yeah. And, and not only that, you know, I have a feeling that even if we made them fast for eight hours to do an afternoon exercise, because we don't have quite the same amount of growth hormone and cortisol in the afternoon, I think it tends to drop off a bit more later in the day. Mm. Um, I have a feeling that it probably wouldn't be as pronounced. And again, that's just a guess, right? It would also be really interesting to throw in a lunchtime sort of like early afternoon protocol where they've had breakfast and then waited five or six hours and then done it around midday, because we know that that's also, you know, a pattern of exercise that a lot of people do, right? The busiest times at the gym are first thing in the morning throughout the lunch hour and right after work, right? Mm -hmm. And we've tried to, in a lot of our studies, use timing that would be representative of what people would actually do in real life. This might be a bit of an unfair question, but I mean, essentially what, what we're talking about is differences in time of day, you know, so it's not just the fact that you fasted, but actually we're talking about circadian changes in hormonal responses. So what about people who do like shift work? You know, what happens if, you, what happens if you're on night shift? I mean, well, what, what, have you got any data on that? <laughs> have you got any any insight? You usually got some data on some things. So we, well, we have a little bit of insight, not very much data. We know from you know things like the nurse's health study that screwing up your sleep patterns really messes with your metabolism. And, and so we've seen, you know, weight gain for people who haven't increased their caloric intake simply because their sleep patterns have been messed up. And what do you think is actually causing that weight gain then? That is not my area of expertise. Do you, do you have an idea that you wanted to comment on? Uh, or even Dar oh. Daria might know with, with some of her nutrition yeah. stuff. I'm yeah, just thinking really like maybe point. they are just using different like types of fuel because A, well, they're also stressed. So that can play a role. So it's like obviously screwing up your patterns really stresses, like makes your body respond as a stress. And that we know does lead to weight gain. So maybe that's partially the yeah. thing. And then- they're not and like they're not slept enough so they're not rested and again that makes them hungrier because like ghrelin hello so maybe those things yeah i think it's definitely major contributors but i also think a major factor is exactly the or a very similar mechanism to what you described before jane you know that kind of increase in cortisol that kind of stress response the changes fuel metabolism you know preferential uh, preferential storage of fatty acids and also an increase of insulin resistance as well so mm -hmm. um, yeah it's it's interesting it's not it's not just kind of waking up and not having anything to eat but it's taking into consideration the kind of circadian rhythm and you know what's what's normal for you which is obviously we, incredible we have historically participants like we it's actually an exclusion criteria for a lot of our studies that if you do shift work you can't participate in our studies and we have found sort of again more anecdotal than actual hard data but we've we've had people try to participate in our studies and just be so all over the place in terms of their eating and their insulin. And uh, it was just too hard for them to, to have the regular schedule that we needed for them to be a participant. But we were also finding that it, it made their glucose more volatile. I honestly don't know how people can do shift work on pens. I just, I don't understand. Probably they can, but it just must be so difficult. Yeah, I would agree. Jane, is there an intention to give us the full picture, which would be, as Daria suggests, perhaps doing a, a fasted and a non-fasted in the morning and perhaps a, a fasted in the afternoon or evening as well? Well, if I can get funding for that, I would actually be really happy to do that study. You know, money is always the big driver here, right? It's uh, when you're trying to get funding for exercise studies, you have to definitely show that there's going to be a really big benefit somehow. And in this case, yeah, we can always argue that hypoglycemia is because that's the, we, we, it's all about hypoglycemia with type one diabetes. We know this from working with patient groups that it is the biggest burden. It is the biggest problem. It is what causes the most hospital visits. So, you know, that's, that's what we try to use for our argument for almost all of our grant applications. 
And, you know, the problem type one diabetes is the neglected little cousin of diabetes, right? You know, you try to make these arguments that we need to do these exercise studies. And sometimes we get reviewer comments that say things along the lines of, well, this is too small a population to really make it worthwhile to study for that amount of money. I know. And and I feel for you. And that's why I I keep fighting to try and get money to do these types of studies. But yeah, that would be an excellent follow follow up study for sure. And it's one that I've considered doing. And that's uh, the design that has been used by one study in the past, but they had an even smaller sample size than I did. Jane, can we visit the um, the afternoon exercise? Because the first words I wrote down when I was reading this was insulin on board, having issues with blood sugars dropping. I just thought, well, you know, even if it is three hours after taking your last set of shots or eating, you must have some insulin on board. Even if you haven't got some insulin on board from that food, you probably got some some sort of stored insulin. And we all know that that sort of gets supercharged when you exercise. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually just looking at the numbers right now for the afternoon exercise session. On average, we saw a decrease from 9.9 to 9.5. So not much of a change. And statistically, it wasn't significant. There were a few people that dropped fairly quickly. And we did give them a snack before exercise. Most people didn't bolus with that snack, but a couple of people decided to do it to, to give that bolus. But we didn't actually see a correlation between those that bolused and the drop in blood glucose. So yes, there is probably a bit more insulin on board when you're doing afternoon exercise. We, I think seven of our participants were using pumps and we actually asked them, you know, what does your pump estimate as the insulin on board? And so for bolus insulin, there was almost nothing left for any of them. But again, basil's always going to be around, right? So it's extremely variable. And, you know, the other thing about that whole basal decrease for the, the pen users if you've got somebody whose entire, you know, insulin dose is like, you know, three units of basal for an entire day. And there are some people like that who just have extremely low basal insulin needs. It's really hard to take 10% less when it's that little, right? So yeah, huge amount of variability. That's kind of the bottom line on almost all studies. (laughs) Yeah, I'm laughing because I actually used to be one of those people, but now I'm at a whole of a six units. So, (laughs) um, What I was going to actually ask is, do you know what the people used as their basal insulins? Because obviously the action profiles of Levomir versus Traceba versus Lantus or whatever there is are very different. I do have those data somewhere. If you really want to see them, I can look them up. We do actually. I was just asking because, well, how comparable are they? Because even if a person does like, say they're once a day, say they do Lantus once a day, if they do it in the morning versus in the evening, that will be a very different response whilst they're exercising. Because despite the fact they tell us there are no peaks, there of course are peaks of long acting insulin. Absolutely. Yeah. The the majority of our participants were actually injecting at night. We have all of these data. Like if, if you wanted to do a secondary analysis on this as a fun project for a dietitian, we know exactly how much they took. We know exactly when they took it. And yes, part of the problem is that, you know, we have all this variability in terms of how much insulin is taken, when it's taken, what type of insulin that it actually is. And that's when we come into these discussions over like ecological validity, because we have some studies that have actually put all of their participants on the same type of insulin to make very specific adjustments at very specific times. But then when you look at the outcomes, well, then it's only applicable to people using that specific type of insulin and only exercising at those specific times. So if you make your studies more inclusive, usually you get more variability in the outcomes, which you can see this study had a lot of variability. It's plus or minus three millimoles per liter for the changes, right? But at the same time, when you see trends, it might be a bit more indicative of what you're going to see in the general population, just because we have more different types of insulin included and more different regimens included. And, you know, we didn't exclude pumpers and we didn't exclude people using FIASP or Traceba or whatever it might be. Right. Yeah. So I'm just acutely aware that we've been peppering you with questions for quite a considerable amount of time. (laughs) Could you perhaps, Jane, just go back to the premise behind this study, what it was for, and then if we can revisit the conclusions, and I think that would probably be a a good place for us to, to sort of make final comments across the board. Sure. I mean, the whole idea was that uh, with high intensity interval exercise and type one diabetes studies up until quite recently had shown a lot of variability in their outcome. And especially in that 
there were a lot of people saying that high intensity exercise makes blood glucose go up in type one diabetes. And I'm a firm believer that it doesn't consistently do that. And that it only does it more consistently when people are in a fasted state, because almost all of the studies that we have that show an increase in glucose with high intensity exercise, whether it be sprints, intervals, weightlifting, all of the ones that show an increase in glucose have fasted participants. And so to kind of make my point, I took the same group of people and made them do a really high intensity protocol so that we could say it was intense enough to cause that adrenaline response that everyone says causes that increase in glucose. And with the afternoon exercise, it wasn't enough to cause an increase in glucose in most of our participants. There were some people that were really high responders and did see that increase both morning and afternoon, but the vast majority either stayed flat or went down in the afternoon and went sort of flat or up in the morning with a high intensity intervals. Right. So I guess the overall message there is for a lot of what we've seen, fasted exercise might be a really good option for people who have a lot of hypoglycemia problems with exercise, who have difficulty adjusting their insulin around exercise. You probably don't need as much adjustment first thing in the morning. And we tend to see less hypoglycemia uh, if you do that exercise before eating or injecting any insulin. Awesome. Awesome. Daria, is there anything else that you wanted to, 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 to add from your side? I think no, I think it's a really, really good study. And it's good that like this research is happening. But well, it is all very variable. And as I said, like, just don't be too stressed about it and go with the flow. Sometimes don't be too meticulous with with your blood glucose management. I'm going to say that being active is more important than being meticulously, precisely and tightly controlled. Agreed. Love that. I love that. Matt, is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I think Jane, Jane's done a really good job at summarising main uh, take-home messages there. The only, the only thing that I would add was the kind of last sentence within the results of the abstract, you know, which was when you exercise in a non-fasted state, then it's associated with a higher frequency of, of hyperglycemic events, you know. So potentially not only do you get you know, more exposure to hyperglycemia, but, you know, potentially more, more variability. And I think what would be really nice to see is whether there's any longer lasting effects and to see whether that impacts hyperglycemia, you know, much later on in the day, you know, so does it, does it impact your risk of going low or your risk of going high or your blood glucose variability longer in the day? But again, just to reiterate one of Jane's points, you know, to answer some of those questions, we really need the funding to be able to do it. And it's pretty difficult to get in this uh, in this uh, particular you know line of work. The everlasting problem of science, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to do a drug study, you can probably get funding fairly easily, but exercise not so much. Mm -hmm. And my takeaways from this were there are once again, every time we have one of these and we sit here and we talk, there are so many factors that we bring in both the people that are diabetic and you guys that are working on the medical side. We talk about these factors and we say they will have an effect. They do have an effect. And how do we get past that? Ultimately, it is very personal and you, and you have to try and what, find your own way through this, this kind of quagmire of, uh, of what could potentially be very dangerous but what also is very important to do you know not doing it is as you said Jane not doing it is is really not the answer the answer is to try and find a way through this but the other takeaway was that you need more female volunteers for these kind of studies so yeah if anyone's watching this and you want to volunteer and again anyone watching this and you've got any messages any questions please just just put them in and like and subscribe, of course. But um, if you want to uh, volunteer, then I'm sure Matt or Jane would be happy to hear from you. So, Jane, again, thank you so much. Daria, thank you so much for your time. Really, really enjoyed this. This worked better than I thought it would. <laughs> Mainly because we peppered you with questions, Jane, and you and you answered them flawlessly. Again, thank you so much, everyone. Really, really enjoyed that. Thank you for doing this. It's great that we can get some of our, our science out there because not everyone has access to the journals that we publish in. So this type of work is very important. Oh, no problem at all. The link will be below to the research papers. Thanks again. Cheers, guys. Mm -hmm.